So my name is Shafali. I am currently a radiation oncologist at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. And today we're going to be discussing high yield clinical applications of IMRT for part one of this lecture. And I just want to thank, thank RCC for giving me this opportunity to present and meet everyone here. So for part one of this lecture, we're going to be covering the use of IMRT for head and neck, GYN, GU, breast, and lung. And then part two, which will be, um, the lecture will be given next Wednesday at the same time. I will be covering GI, CNS, sarcoma, pediatric, and lymphoma. So to begin with, we'll discuss uh, head and neck. And so just first, I'm going to discuss randomized outcomes. And this was through the PARSPORT trial for oropharynx and hypopharynx. So just a little bit of background. So radiation-induced serostomia is the most commonly reported late side effect of, of radiation to the head and neck. And as we all know that the lack of saliva can affect speech and swallowing, and it can also cause poor dentition. Um, multiple small studies have showed reduction in uh, radiation to the parotid gland using IMRT, which could help the recovery of salivary flow. So the PARSPORT trial um, was a randomized phase three trial, which was multi-center done in the UK and it in, involving six sites. And they looked at 3D conformal versus IMRT for the treatment of squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck, which are origi originating from the oral pharynx or the hypopharynx. In the study, the patients had regular follow-up, salivary flow measurements, and quality of life questionnaires. In the study, the primary tumor was treated with 60 to 65 gray. The nodal groups were treated from 50 to 54 gray. And then the parotid was constrained to a mean dose of less than 24 grams. In terms of the results, 94 patients were enrolled and 41% of these patients received neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And they noted that the mean dose to the whole contralateral parotid was significantly less with IMRT. So one of the figures in the paper, as you can see, to the contralateral parotid with IMRT, the mean dose was about 25 gray versus 61 gray with conventional radiation with 3D conformal. In terms of the results, at 12 months, serostomia was reported in 75% of patients receiving 3D conformal versus 38% of those getting IMRT. And at um, 24 months, what, what was interesting, serostomia actually worsened in the 3D conformal group with 83% reporting it versus an improvement was noted in the IMRT group. At 12 months, the unstimulated um, saliva flow from the contralateral parotid was 47% versus 0% um, in the IMRT group. And at 12 and 24 months, there were sig clinically um, significant improvements in dry mouth specific and global quality of life scores. So as these um, figures show, in the red is the 3D conformal, and it kind of indicates the um, improvement in the salivary function in uh, both of these charts with um, respect to the different questionnaires that they used in the study. And as you can see, it's um, interesting with the 3D conformal, even with well, in terms of long-term toxicity, it seems to either um, stabilize or get worse with time. Whereas when these patients are treated with IMRT, the salivary function, it is present initially, but it does gradually improve. And so there seems to be much of a, a statistically significant recovery of salivary function, especially at 24 months in patients treated with IMRT. In terms of the results, uh, to continue on about the trial, there was absolutely no difference in non-xerostomia late toxicities, local regional control, or overall survival. And just to demonstrate, so this is a figure that shows some comparative plants. And as you can see with 2DRT, you know, so many of the structures are getting quite a bit of the OARs are getting a significant amount of the dose, especially the parotids almost look like they're getting full dose. With 3D conformal, we see a more conformal dose distribution. However, the parotids are still getting a significant amount of the, of the dose. Whereas with IMRT, we are able to carve out the parotids very specifically. And in turn, we, this trial had done, the PARSPORT trial demonstrated a statistically significant benefit in salivary function in patients who are treated with IMRT. Next for head and neck, we're gonna move on to discuss non-randomized outcomes and specifically focus on the UCSF experience for nasopharynx. So just a little bit of background. So tumor control for nasopharyngeal carcinoma is high, highly correlated to the dose delivered to the tumor. And because the nasopharynx is surrounded by critical normal tissues, accuracy and conformality is essential. So in, for the UCSF experience that was published, they performed a retrospective review of nasopharyngeal cancer patients treated with IMRT. The gross tumor and positive notes were treated to 65 to 70 gray at 2.12 to 2.25 gray per fraction. The clinical target volume was treated to 50 to 60 gray at 1.8 to 2 gray per fraction. And 75% of patients received concurrent cisplatin and adjuvant cisplatin in 5FU. 
terms of the results, 67 patients were treated with IMRT. The median follow-up was 31 months. The four-year local progression-free survival was 97%. The four-year regional progression-free survival was 98%. And the four-year overall survival was 88%. As you can see, the outcomes with IMRT um, were excellent. In terms of the toxicity, so compared to all other toxicities, xerostomia was the most pronounced. And about 20% of patients had grade 1 xerostomia and 39% had grade 2 xerostomia. As you can see, though, in the IMRT group, at, at about 18 to 24 months, the grade 2 toxicity does decrease, and there is there is a recovery of function in these patients. So these were the two studies I wanted to talk that I that highlighted the impact of and the benefits of IMRT specifically for salivary function for head and neck patients. Before I move on to the next section, are there any questions? Um, so next, we're going to touch on the benefits of IMRT for GYN. So in this section, we're going to discuss randomized outcomes, specifically the NRGRTOG 1203, the TIME-C study for postoperative cervical and endometrial cancer. And then we'll also be discussing non-randomized outcomes, focusing in on a meta-analysis um, that was done for definitive cervical cancer, as well as the University of Pittsburgh experience for preoperative vulvar cancer. So just a little bit of background, GI toxicity for, uh, can occur in 30% of patients receiving radiation for uterine cancer. Treatment with concurrent chemo may produce even higher rates of toxicity. Pelvic IMRT does allow for lower doses to be delivered to the small bowel and the bladder. However, before this, the time C study was done, no previous studies analyzed the impact of pelvic IMRT on patient reported toxicity in gynecologic malignancies. So RTOG-1203, they included women with invasive cervical or endometrial cancer treated with hysterectomy, and then they were randomized to either 3D conformal radiation or IMRT. The patients were treated um, to 45 gray or 50.4 gray based on the physician preference. And then five cycles of cisplatin were delivered at the physician's discretion. It was a phase three randomized study. The patients completed multiple quality of life questionnaires, including the EPIC, the PRO, CTCAE, the FACT, CX, and the Euro quality of life. And then physician reported adverse events were graded using the CTCAE terminology. So this trial en enrolled 289 patients, 109 were assigned to receive IMRT and 144 to receive 3D conformal and 71% received chemotherapy. In terms of the bowel outcomes, they noted a larger mean decrease in the EPIC bowel summary and subscale scores between uh, baseline um, and week three and five evaluation with 3D conformal compared to IMRT. And then 51.9% versus 33.7% of patients in 3D conformal were versus IMRT reported frequent or almost constant diarrhea. In terms of the urinary outcomes, there was a larger mean decrease in EPIC urinary summary score between um, baseline and uh, week three and five for standard versus IMRT. In terms of physician reported toxicity, there were no differences in reported outcomes. And in terms of the quality of life, the mean score of the cervical cancer subgroup showed significantly worse decline in 3D conformal versus the IMRT group. And so this is a figure from the paper that highlights the change in the EPIC bowel scores and the urinary scores. As you can see with IMRT, they had less bowel side effects, though by week four to six between IMRT and standard RT, the toxicity had improved for both groups to being roughly equivalent. In terms of the urinary side effects, you can see that with 3D conformal, there are worse side effects. And the urinary side effects seems to even persist after four to six weeks post-radiation compared to those patients who receive IMRT who seem to have more of a significant improvement. And then just to show you some comparative plans. So on your left is the IMRT plan for postoperative cervix. And then on the right is the four field box. And as you can see, it's clearly evident that the, the IMRT allows for much better bowel sparing as well as much better bladder sparing, as you can see here, compared to the traditional four-field box technique that we use. Now I'm going to move on to discuss non-randomized outcomes for GYN, and we're going to be focusing on the meta-analysis for definitive cervical cancer and then the University of Pittsburgh experience for vulvar cancer. Just a little bit of background. So cervical cancer is the second most common malignant tumor in women. 3D conformal radiation um, is an important technique to reduce toxicity. IMRT has been associated with lower GI and hematological toxicities when compared to conventional radiation. So there was a meta-analysis that was performed, and it included a review of six articles comparing IMRT and 3D conformal, though those, and then, or 2D, which were also included. 
terms of the results, IMRT was associated with significantly lower grade two and three acute GI toxicity. IMRT was also associated with significantly lower grade two and three acute GU toxicity. IMRT was also associated with significantly lower chronic grade three GU toxicity. And there were no differences in three-year overall survival between the, between the techniques that were looked at. And he, this figure here shows some comparative plans. And as you can see, the IMRT plans are at the top and then the 3D conformal at the bottom. And you can see that the IMRT plans where you can carve out bladder, allow for bla better bladder span. And at the same time, you can see that the bowel dose is also less um, when you're looking at the sagittal views of the plan. Before I move on, and then now I'm going to be moving on to Wolfar cancer. Just a little bit of uh, background on this. It's a relatively rare cancer, as we all know. The treatment for unresectable and high-risk disease includes radiation, which is commonly delivered with APPA fields. And IMRT has the potential to reduce dose to normal tissue, including small bowel, bladder, and rectum. So the University of Pittsburgh experience was a retrospective review of patients with vulvar cancer treated with IMRT. There was a subset of patients who also planned with 3D conformal radiation for comparison, and then the toxicity was, was graded by the RTOG criteria. In terms of the results, 15 patients were evaluated, and a median dose um, of 46.6 gray was uh, given in the preoperative group and 40.3 gray in the postoperative group. In the adjuvant group, five patients were treated to pelvic and groin nodes and three treated to the vulva and nodes. And the mean volume of the small bowel, rectum, and bladder that received more than 30 gray was reduced with IMRT compared to 3D conformal. Overall, there was a 71% complete clinical response in the pre-op treatment group, and the most common toxicity was grade 2 dermatitis. And there was the only grade 3 toxicity that occurred was small bowel. No treatment break was required in the adjuvant group, and one patient de developed grade 3 late toxicity. And so this is a figure that shows the comparative plans. And as you, as for vulvar cancer, we generally do treat the inguinal lymph nodes and that can make the radiation fields quite large. And so as you can imagine with a 3D conformal plan, in order to encompass the inguinal nodes with adequate dose, as, as well as in, incorporate the pelvis, the, the, the radiation dose of the bowel can especially be quite high. Whereas with IMRT, we are able to get much more conformal plans that allow us to better spare the bladder as well as the small bowel. Any questions on GYN before I move on to the next section? Yeah, I have one quick question. So, so I'm a medical physicist, so maybe it's a little bit more basic, but are there any like contraindications or reasons not to use IMRT for GYN cancers? So the thing is, the so in general, um, in the United States, if we're treating cervical cancer, unless we're unless we're trying to also treat the periaortic nodes, we generally do forefield box because like I mentioned, there's no um, randomized evidence in this situation for definitive cervical cancer to treat this. And then there's also the concern that we know that, you know, depending on bladder filling, the uterus and then also on tumor shrinkage, the uterus can move, out, move around quite a bit. And so there's also a question that if we reduce our margins too much, we might potentially miss the target. And so that's why if we're just treating, if we're treating definitive cervical and there are no periodic nodes involved, or field box is still what, what it, most people do in practice. Though we are getting more information about motion management, especially now since a lot of centers are starting to do MRI-guided radiation therapy, and that is giving us some more insight real-time what is happening to the, the tumors as they shrink in these cervical cancer patients and potentially could have implications with IMRT having more widespread use. Any other questions? Thank you. All right, next I'm going to move on to discuss GU. Um, and specifically focus on randomized outcomes, which, in, which came from a Brazilian study that was done for prostate cancer. Um, so this is a little bit of background on this. Multiple studies have shown a benefit to dose escalation for prostate cancer. Excess dose to the bladder and rectum may result in treatment-related toxicity. Several retrospective and prospective series demonstrate that IMRT reduces radiation dose to organs at risk and decreases acute and late toxicity. So the Brazilian study was done on follow, and they had a randomized clinical trial of patients with localized prostate cancer treated with 3D conformal or IMRT at a single institution. The patients were treated with 70 gray and 25 fractions, and the primary endpoint was acute and late toxicity. So in terms of the results, 215 patients were enrolled onto a randomized clinical study. IMRT resulted in decreased dose to the rectum and bladder. Grade two or more G acute GI toxicity was 24% versus in the 3D conformal versus 7% in the IMRT, which was statistically significant. Grade two or more acute, sorry, 
Um, the first one is GI toxicity. I misspoke. A grade two or more acute GU toxicity was 12.3% of 3D conformal versus 3.7% of the IMRT, which was also statistically significant. And then grade two or more late GI toxicity was 21.7% in 3D conformal versus 6.4% in IMRT in the IMRT group. There was no difference in biochemical control. So this is a figure that kind of highlights the, the grade two or more GI toxicity up top and the grade two or more acute GU toxicity below. As you can see, the 3D conformal um, group on average tended to have more of these toxicities compared to the IMRT group. And then in terms of the cumulative toxicity, it was definitely um, more pronounced in the 3D conformal group versus the IMRT group. And then this is a figure that demonstrates some comparative plans for prostate cancer involving 3D conformal versus IMRT. And as you can see with 3D conformal, you get quite a bit of excess dose, especially to the rectum and the bladder. Whereas with IMR, we are able to kind of have more conformal dose distribution along the prostate and spare, especially spare the rectum and the bladder, which in turn translates to decreased toxicities during treatment and after treatment. Any questions on GU before I move on to the next section? So next, we're going to move on and discuss breast cancer and specifically look at randomized outcomes, including the Canadian study for whole breast, as well as the Florence study for accelerated partial breast irradiation. Just a little bit of background. So dermatitis is a frequent adverse effect of breast radiation therapy. Dermatitis occurs more frequently in large-breasted women with inhomogeneous dose distributions. And then IMRT may ensure more dose homogeneity as compared to conventional tangential field. How the study was conducted, it was a phase three randomized study. Women with operable early stage breast cancer referred for adjuvant radiation were enrolled. The patients were treated with 50 gray and 25 fractions with an additional 16 gray boost per discretion of the treating physician. IMRT was forward planned using a multi-leaf collimator to generate field and fields to compensate for missing tissue. Clinical outcomes included acute skin reaction or pain using CTCAE and the incidence of moist desquamation and then quality of life was obtained using the EORTC QLQ C30 scale. Um, in terms of the results, the breast IMRT decreased the maximum dose, sagittal dose gradient, and hot spots in the inframammary fold. And there was a trend towards fewer CTCAE grade three to four acute skin reactions. Breast IMRT also significantly reduced the occurrence of moist desquamation. However, despite this, there was no difference in quality of life or pain between the treatment arms. So these are some comparative plans where I took from the, the paper of the study. And basically, as you can see with 3D conformal, and just keep in mind, this was 3D conformal that was planned using the, the wedge technique. You have a more inhomogeneous dose distribution compared to IMRT. And then in terms of the comparative plans, this is also another figure that highlights how with IMRT, you have a more homogeneous dose distribution. So I just wanted to kind of bring up a few points of how I apply this in my own clinical practice. So basically in the United States, I am for whole breast radiation, the standard of care is actually 3D conformal. But the reason that we do 3D conformal over IMRT is because we have the capability of doing field and field. Um, which pretty much reduces, which gives us the ability to reduce the hot spots and actually get a very nice conformal. I'm sorry, was some, someone trying to say something? Okay. And so, so like on a day-to-day -day basis, we pretty much for full breast radiation would never consider doing IMRT because of the field and field technique that we can use with 3D conformal. And as you can imagine, if you do IMRT, especially ARC therapy with VMAT, there's a higher chance of getting low dose radiation to the heart and the lungs. Whereas when we do tangents, we're able to spare it quite well. In addition, you know, we do take in patients that do have larger breasts, another technique that allows us to continue to use 3D conformal as opposed to have to resort to IMRT is using a prone breast because whenever we turn patients on their bellies and put them in that position and do their treatment, their degree of separation of the breast decreases. And so we are able, even with 3D conformal in the prone position, to get very nice dose distributions that are homogeneous with minimal hot spots and avoid using IMRT in this setting. Okay. So to move on to discuss accelerated partial breast irradiation, so that's also been introduced as an alternative treatment for patients with early stage breast cancer. The Florence study was a randomized phase two trial that was developed to compare APVI with IMRT versus conventional fractionated tan tangent fields. So this, patient, this study had patients who received 3D conformal to the whole breast with 50 gray and 25 fractions well, versus patients who received APVI with 30 gray and five daily fractions. And then just to um, quickly review the inclusion exclusion criteria. So these were your very low risk early stage breast cancer patients. They had to be above the age of 40. 
They had to have a tumor size um, of less than 25 millimeters, a wide excision or quadrantrectomy with clear margins that were greater than five millimeters. There were clips had to be placed in the tumor bed, you know, full informed consent and had to be obtained. And then these patients had to be, you know, be willing to follow up at, at the center. In terms of the patients that were excluded, if they had cardiac dysfunction, if they have if they had EFT abnormalities, if they had extensive intraductal carcinoma, multifocal cancer, psychiatric problems, or were not able to follow up at their center. In terms of the results, there were no differences in target coverage. 66.5% versus 19.9% any grade toxicity was reported in the tangents versus the um, APDI, which was statistically significant. And as you can imagine, this also makes sense because, you know, with the APBI, you're treating a much smaller treatment at volume. And so you are in general going to be getting um, much less um, toxicity since the volume is so much smaller. But at the same time, with the APBI, you are doing a higher, higher dose per fraction. And it's um, interesting to see that the toxicity is enhanced when we are doing this technique. Um, also, 37.7% versus 2% versus two had um, grade 2 or more toxicity in the tangent versus the APBI, which is also just statistically significant. And these are some comparative plans from the patients that were treated in the study. So this figure shows whole breast radiation treated with the free breathing technique. And I especially want you to kind of pay attention to how this like blue isodose wash kind of falls. And as you can see, using whole breast with free breathing, quite a bit of the heart is going to be getting what is comes to about 8 to 12 gray. However, when they did whole breast radiation treatment with deep inspiration breath hold, we are able to spare the heart some. And then when we do 3D conformal with accelerated partial breast radiation and free breathing, still quite a bit of the heart is getting dosed. Versus if we incorporate that with deep inspiration breath hold, more of the heart is spared. And then if you compare this image to this other image, which is IMRT APBI, you can see that the cardiac doses with either technique are pretty comparable. So basically, if you're doing APBI and if you have the capability of doing deep inspiration breath hold, the benefits of IMRT and sparing the heart are really not as significant if you have this technique available to you. All right. And then a few other things, a few, few points that I wanted to kind of bring up just in my own practice about, so we talked about full breast, we talked about APBI. Post-mastectomy radiation treatment is something where we don't really have any randomized evidence. There's not too much data to support the use of IMRT in the setting. However, I do sometimes use IMRT for these types of patients, depending on the clinical scenario, especially when we're trying to cover regional nodes. There's some patients with, with their anatomy, and especially if they have very aggressive pathology with, you know, more than 50% of lymph nodes involved with a lot of extra nodal extension, with the, IM, the internal mammary nodes are involved, and we need to make sure we get decent coverage of them. Sometimes, usually with my thought process, I try to set up with wide tangents with 3D conformal first, but the lung and the heart dose is too high then I would consider trying to do tangents with a mesh electron field. But sometimes um, that doesn't necessarily give me a very good dose, distribu dose distribution, especially if the patients are very large and have, and have like a lot of fat and a lot of separation to the internal mammary nodes. And so if that doesn't work, then I, I do occasionally resort to doing IMRT plans for these patients because IMRT plans do allow me to get better regional node coverage depending on the patient scenario compared to more conventional techniques. But overall, in general, we prefer to try to do 3D conformal for breast cancer if we can, but then depending on circumstances, we might consider IMRT even depending on the clinical scenario. Okay. Any any questions before I move on to the next topic? Yes, I have a question. How do you manage chest wall with nodes? So like I was saying, so chest wall with nodes, for the NCCM guidelines, they recommend chest wall radiation plus regional nodal radiation for patients that are node positive either prior to neoadjuvant chemotherapy or have nodes found after they undergo surgery. And so what I tend to do is initially when I try to set up the fields for these patients, I try to do wide tangents and try to get a, a 3D conformal plan. But this can be especially tricky when you're treating the left chest wall. And then some of my patients, they might also have like reconstruction done. They might, you know, have an implant. They might have a tissue expander. And just depending on their anatomy, especially if they're larger patients, sometimes the wide tangents just don't set up very well. So if this doesn't work, then I move on to try to do a tangent with a matched electron field to cover the IMNs. But depending on the scenario, especially if a patient has a lot of thickness from their chest wall, from their chest to the IMNs, sometimes the coverage isn't great. And then sometimes there's just a lot of hot spots with how the with the, the bowing out of the, the electron isodose curves. 
And so if that doesn't work, then a lot of times I end up doing VMAT for my patients who are getting chest wall plus regional nodal irradiation, especially if I'm very concerned about like their IMNs potentially being involved or them having a significant burden of the disease in the axilla. Because I found that this technique really allows me to get the best amount of dose to these areas, especially when 3D conformal is just not giving me the coverage that I want to get. Okay. Okay. I think, how do you manage cases where we, we have dermatitis? For radiation dermatitis, so from, for whole breast cancer, I, 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 I generally hypofractionate my patients. So I use 4256 centigrade and 16 fractions. And the thing is, usually when I treat patients this way, you don't even necessarily see any skin reaction until about a week or so after they finish radiation therapy. During treatment, uh, what, what I advise my patients to use is like they, this uh, cream called Aquaphor, just to kind of keep the skin moisturized and to keep it from not getting too dry. But then if I do notice that they are developing some dry or moist desquamation, especially one week after radiation, I give them sylvidine to use. They just apply a thin layer twice a day until everything heals up. And then usually within a few weeks, they're okay. So, but in general, my whole breast patients, and, and if they're large, if they have large breasts, I generally treat them in the prone position, which also keeps, allows like less skin on skin contact and less of a bolusing effect, which also helps prevent them from getting very serious skin reactions after the fact. In terms of post mastectomy radiation, I use a brass bolus, and I know different institutions have different bolus materials that they use, but the brass bolus, if you aren't familiar with it, it's it's a it's a very thin, it's like a gold colored, it's it's almost like it just kind of nicely lays over the fabric, lays over like fabric over the patient's chest wall. Compared to flat bolus, I prefer it because there's really not that many air gaps or anything when you're placing this so it places a lot nicer and a lot easier and it's a more it, it, at least to me it's a lot more reproducible day to day but what I have noticed is when I use a brass bolus the dose tends to get a little hotter faster and so I tend to I keep an eye on my patients and once I notice that them to have about moderate skin darkening I tell my therapist to remove the bolus because I don't want them to have a very, very serious skin reaction by the end of treatment. And then also for in general that when I tell my therapist to review the bolus, it's usually around 40 gray. So almost towards the end of the treatment. And then I, I manage it the same way I manage it for whole breast with aquaphor during treatment twice a day for patients. And then if they do oh. dry desquamation, I use so many. Right. There's also two additional questions from the chat. The three now. The first one is... I'll go with the bolus question first. Do you use bolus for all of your post mastectomy patients? I do because um, the highest risk of recurrence is in the skin of the chest wall. There are rare scenarios depending on, you know, if the patient had a very small tumor, et cetera, you can consider not using it. But in my practice, I pretty much, I bolus everyone post mastectomy. The second question, can you share your thoughts on doing IMRT and VMAT without any motion management for breast? Are you talking about like 4DCT? I am thinking that it is more like um, deep inspiration, inspiration breath hold. Deep holder, inspiration breath hold. Okay. okay. So for, for left-sided, I, if I am treating a left-sided chest wall with regional nodes, I, I, I have an electa machine with the ABC breathing. So I do use deep inspiration breath hold. If my patients can tolerate it, if they're not, if they're not able to tolerate it, we we still treat them with the IMRT because at the institution where I trained, that was just a general practice, and we didn't really see too many issues in terms of getting adequate dose. Because you can also tell if they're getting ad adequate dose if they're to the skin and everything, if they're getting um, enough of a skin reaction. And with the IMRT um, and the VMAT, they were all pretty much responding as they would have with the 3D conformal in terms of the toxicity. Thank you. And the last question has to do with selecting patients for the IMN delivery. How do you manage the cardiac dose in those scenarios and how do you select those patients? So it, so in general, I try to cover the IMN nodes if I can, because based on our current guidelines and then the data that we have available and the NCCN guidelines, they pretty much say that if any nodes, even an axillary node is, axillary node is involved, they strongly re recommend comprehensive nodal irradiation, which includes the IMN. So I try to do that, but depending on the scenario, you know, if I have a patient, you know, who's left-sided, who I can't get to do any motion management with a heart that's really pressing up against the chest wall, and if I just... Ideally, I would want the mean heart dose to be less than five gray, but if there's 
no way that I'm able to meet this constraint. And then depending on patient factors, if they're fairly young or if they have like a significant cardiac history, et cetera, I, I kind of sometimes, depending on the situation, I might choose to omit the IMNs and then depending on where the tumor is located, using clinical judgment, as, and especially if I can't get a safe plan, I usually strive to get the mean heart dose to um, less than three gray if I can even if I am treating IMNs, but I'll accept up to five gray. But with motion management, and then also by using VMAT, I'm usually able to get those plans, even in the more trickier scenario where it's left-sided chest walls that we're treating. Okay, and then one more came up that I think will be quick. What bolus thickness are you using in IMRT and 3D CRT? Are they similar, the same? So I actually use a brass bolus, which is, I don't exactly know the thickness, but it's, it's a very thin piece of like material that's almost kind of like a fabric that drapes over the patients. I don't use um, the traditional flat bolus. And then where I trained, we were, we also use the same brass bolus. The reason I, I prefer the brass bolus over the flat bolus is it, it just, because it's like a fabric, it just sort of very nicely drapes over the chest wall and covers everything that we want to cover to minimize the amount of air gaps, which can be kind of tricky with a flat bolus. I know some institutions, you know, they might use like five millimeter flat bolus. And then it, some institutions, they'll actually alternate. Like every other day, they'll bolus the patient to try to prevent doing a skin reaction. With the brass bolus, what I do is I keep an eye on the patients. If I notice a moderate skin reaction, which usually happens around 40 gray, that's when I pull it off and then continue on because I don't want the moist desquamation to be too severe by the end of the treatment. Good questions. Anything else or we're ready to move on? I think we can move on. All right, and then now we're going to move on to discuss lung cancer and specifically review the non-randomized outcomes from the RTOG 0617 secondary analysis. So just a little bit of background. So RTOG 0617 was, was designed to determine the efficacy of 74 gray versus 60 gray for definitive treatment of stage three non-small cell lung cancer. The overall survival was um, 28.7 months after standard radiation, 20.3 months after high dose radiation therapy. And then patients were treated with 3D conformal or IMRT at the physician's discretion. In terms of the materials and methods, like I said, it was a secondary analysis that was performed after the fact. And in, with the results, there were 482 patients that were enrolled. 53% were treated with 3D conformal and 47% with IMRT. The IMRT group had larger treatment planning volumes, 427 versus 486 milliliters, which was statistically significant. And the IMRT group was also more likely to be stage 2B. In terms of the results, no differences were appreciated in survival outcomes. IMRT was associated with less grade um, 3 or more pneumonitis, 7.9% um, versus 3.5%, um, which was statistically significant. IMRT also produced lower heart doses, and then a heart V40 was significantly associated with overall survival. And lung V20 was associated with increased grade three or more radiation pneumonitis. And so in terms of the results, this figure kind of highlights, you know, the difference in the treatment volume. So just keep in mind, the patients who did have IMRT in the study had larger volumes of tumors that were treated. And then in terms of the V40, you can see that in the IMRT group, we're able to get less of the 40 grade dose to the volume of the heart with IMRT as opposed to 3D conformal. In addition, this kind of highlights the, uh, the toxicity, some of the grade three or more between 3D conformal and IMRT. As you can see, pneumonitis was the only one that was statistically significant in terms of a difference seen with fewer patients, only 3.5% in the IMRT group developing it versus 7.9% in the 3D conformal. There was not too much of a difference between the esophagitis, dysphagia, weight loss, or cardiovascular toxicities. And then this is a figure that shows some comparative plans. And as you can see with the, you know, with the 3D conformal on your left, you, you just, you end up getting a lot more dosed to critical, to more of the critical structures. And whereas with IMRT, you're able to get a very nice conformal dose distribution. Any, any questions for lung cancer patients treated with IMRT? So this concludes the topics that I'm discussing for today. I know it was a lot of information, but as you can see in the, you know, in the, in the topics that we discussed, IMRT does have a lot of benefits, especially in, in creating more conformal dose distributions and preventing patients from having toxicities. Next Wednesday, I'm going to discuss the applications of IMRT for GI, um, CNS, sarcoma, pediatric cancers, as well as lymphoma. Uh, thank you. And if anybody has any questions, there's still a couple minutes left. Uh, I know we don't want to go past the, the end of the hour, but if anybody has any questions, now would be a great time to ask them. In addition, someone asked about email contact for questions later. I've provided them with Ben's email, which I think everyone should have, but if you're willing to share your email to answer 
questions from this group, that would be fantastic. Yeah, if you could, if you could type that in chat. Oh, that let would me be see if I can do that. Okay. Do that. I actually have it. I don't have any additional questions and it doesn't, yeah, okay, there was one. Great. Is there a higher risk for geographic miss with IMRT, in particular for GYN? So in terms of the post-operative setting with the RTOG 1203 trial, we saw that the outcomes, which it was a randomized study, and we saw the outcomes were the same in terms of disease control for patients treated with IMRT versus 3D conformal. However, like I mentioned, there really isn't a phase three randomized data regarding the use of IMRT in definitive cervical cancer management. And that's why, at least in the United States, we default to using if we're not treating the periodic nodes, we tend to default to using 3D conformal radiation with a four-field box. Because like I mentioned, there's the amount of movement as a tumor shrinks um, in the cervix and how much the uterus will move is still um, still kind of a, a gray area. Though, like I had mentioned before, the newer technology with the MRI-guided radiation therapy, as more and more patients are treated with this modality, when more studies are done, might potentially give us a better idea about adequate motion management. There's also a question about treating with half arcs for VMAT lung cases, if mm -hmm. you have an opinion or a preference. So yeah, depending on where the tumor is located, I do think half arcs are, are, are very useful, and I do use them, depending on the patient scenario. Because as, as you can imagine, um, you know, you don't want to get too much low dose to normal lung, which is if you're using, you know, complete arcs and stuff is not too hard to do. Um, but if you can try to limit the area that you're treating, it can potentially give you a more conformal dose distribution and then, and then also spare the lung from getting too much excess low dose radiation as well. And we use, I use half arcs all the time when I'm doing long SBRTs. Great. And that applies as well for head and neck IMRT, correct? <laughs> so unilateral disease can often be treated with a, with a partial arc or a half arc. No, definitely. Can you share your thoughts on doing IMRT and VMAT? Oh, no, sorry. I already read that one. Well, in the interest of time and, and everyone's busy schedules, I think that since there's not any current questions, we can follow up anything else. I should be a little more patient. What difference do you observe for lung doses with 3D CRT and IMRT? So in my practice, where I practice like, right outside in the Philadelphia area, I tend to get really advanced lung cancer cases where the tumors are huge, and then there's a lot of mediastinum, mediastinum involvement. So pretty much all my cases end up being VMAT, um, because there's almost no way for me to get a good 3D conformal plan without treating most of the lung. Sometimes 3D conformal for lung, um, to be the devil's advocate, can give you a better plan, because depending on where the tumor is located, you could potentially get less low, you know, less lower dose radiation um, to the lung, and then decent coverage. So it is definitely an option. It's just in my own practice, I don't see too many patients that are good candidates for that. I tend to get the more advanced lung cases where VMAT definitely gets me, you know, much better sparing of the esophagus, as well as a lot reduced dose to the lung and, and heart as well. Thank you. If anybody else has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask them. Um, again, it's a great opportunity um, to get an opinion. Um, how do you immobilize your uh, prostate patients? I am Okay. So I, so basically I have them do a bowel prep before I do my radiation planning scan. They try to get the rectum as small as possible. So they basically, they drink mag citrate the night before, and then they do an enema the morning before their scan. And then I also instruct them to drink um, some water to get the bladder comfortably full before I do the radiation planning scan. And then, and then how I simulate them. And when I simulate them, I make sure that their bladder is adequately full. And, and then and I always double check and spot check to make sure that the rectum and everything, like there's not too much gas or anything that they did do the bowel prep adequately. I simulate them supine. I, I do use a vac fix, but I use it not under the pelvis. I just use it for the legs to kind of help stabilize because sometimes there can be a little rotation in terms of setup. And then in, in terms of the treatment days, I instruct all my patients to have a bowel movement before they come in. And then they're also, they also drink water before we put them on the table to get the bladder full. I do obtain daily cone beam CT on my patients as well. And then one more thing I didn't mention, all of my prostate patients are also treated with fiducials. Does that answer your question or anything else specific? Thank you. Uh, we have an additional person who has raised their hand. If that was intentional, feel free to unmute and ask your question. Yes, perfect. If you are trying to talk, we cannot hear you. I see that you have unmuted yourself though, Abe, um, but unfortunately we can't hear you. So maybe that wasn't intentional. So I think that we, we can take any further questions offline. Thank you for the great talk today. You're um, welcome. Thank you for having me. Very informative. Yeah, perfect. Everybody have a great day. The um, Dr. Gujar's email is in the chat as well as Ben's email. I think everyone has, so you can follow up with any questions offline. Thanks for the attendance and have a great day.